What's up, Overflow? Yes, let's go. So excited to be here tonight. Y'all, we have a big night here at Overflow, and I am so pumped. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Clay. These are some of my friends. We'll get to them. We'll get to them in a minute. Don't, don't worry about them. They're just kind of hanging out on the stage. Um, so excited. I want to know this before I introduce these guys. Um, who here tonight is already on spring break? Yeah, come on, let's go. Okay, cool. All right, who here tonight cannot wait till spring break starts this week? All right, there we go, cool, awesome. Um, so people keep asking me, oh Clay, what are you doing on your break? And I'm like, I'm working on my break. I don't have spring break, I'm an adult, come on people. Um, but I am excited for y'all, I'm not jealous. I'm very excited for you guys who are on spring break right now and you're like so relaxed and chill and you're like so happy. And those of y'all who are stressed right now, but are looking forward to next week. So excited for you guys to have that time. So let me introduce you guys to the people behind me. This is, guys, this is our 2019 Guatemala mission team. Let's give it up for them. Yes. Yes, um, y'all, it's so exciting um, to be able to kind of introduce them and just for y'all to see their faces, for them to see y'all's faces. I don't know if I said that wrong. Um, I love um, what these guys are getting ready to do. Um, Zach and Kaylin will be leading this team along with our student leader this year, Landon, um, which is awesome. Um, and they're gonna be leading them this Saturday, flying over to Guatemala City uh, to, with the goal of sharing the love of God, being the hands and feet of Jesus as they partner with pastors, uh, churches, ministries, and seminary students um, as they kind of come around this partnership we have with a theological seminary there in Guatemala City called Sateca. And if you've ever been to Guatemala and you've been to Sateca, there's this, it's like this really deep place in your heart. It's a beautiful place, beautiful people who are um, training and raising up folks just like yourself to go out into the nations, literally, with the gospel. And so we get to go there and partner with them, love on them, and kind of come alongside the things that they're already doing uh, to serve the people of Guatemala. Um, and so that's what these guys are getting ready to do. And listen, I know I've been a part of this team enough to know that um, y'all all don't feel ready. You all don't feel prepared. You all don't feel like you're equipped enough to go on this mission. Um, but that is what it looks like to take a steps of faith. Right, to walk by faith, to say, I'm gonna go. Even though I'm not 100% ready, I don't know everything, I don't speak great Spanish, um, you step, right? And as you step, you trust that God's gonna meet you there. And even you trust that um, even though you don't feel 100% prepared, God has been preparing you for the season. So I'm so excited for you guys to experience that, step into that. And I think that's true for us too, y'all, for, for you guys in the room that we all have an opportunity this week and, and next week on spring break to take steps of faith, to take bold steps of trust, right? And that might be taking a step of faith to share your faith, your story with someone else. Or maybe it's just to pray for someone who's going through some stuff or going out of your way to serve someone or meet a need. Or maybe it's you just staying strong in your faith and your convictions, right? As other people are making decisions that go against what you believe to be true. We all have opportunities to take steps of faith together. And, uh, and that's what we do. So when this team uh, from Overflow goes to Guatemala, we go with them, right? And as you guys go out on the spring break, wherever you go, we're, we're going together because we're a family and we're doing this together. And so I wanna take a moment to pray for this team, uh, but I also wanna be praying for you guys, um, that God would empower you to take those um, big, bold steps of faith. And so um, I'm gonna pray for y'all. So why don't y'all stand up? Let's stand up. Guys, y'all wanna kind of gather around and if you, if you feel comfortable with this, man, y'all can just raise your hand out if you wanna kind of pray with me over these students. Let's just pray for them. I'm gonna pray for you guys and then we're gonna move on in this night. Father God, uh, we thank you for this night. God, we thank you for this team of uh, staff members and students uh, who are taking a step of faith. God, they don't have it all figured out. They're, they're not, um, you know, they're not, they're not paid missionaries. Uh, they, they aren't fluent in Spanish. Um, they don't um, know everything, and yet, God, they're stepping. And I pray, God, that you would meet them there, and God, that you would honor their faith, and God, that you would do something really cool in this team and through this team this next week in Guatemala as they show, just simply show your love and show the joy of being found in Jesus with people there. 
And God, I pray for every student here tonight. God, I pray um, that as they step into, um, they're in on spring break, they're stepping into spring break, God, that you would give them faith to step boldly into things, God. And that as we, as Overflow, do that, Lord, that you would do something really unique in and through us here in Wilmington, throughout the state, and maybe around the world this week. Um, And God, we just ask you to meet us there, strengthen us, empower us by your Holy Spirit. Uh, And God, we love you. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome, guys. Y'all, I'm so excited about this night. I'm so glad you're here. We've got our pastor at our church, Mike Ashcraft, bringing a message about Jesus as Lord. And now we're going to worship together. You guys ready to worship? Yeah. All right, let's, let's sing our hearts, hearts out because God is worthy of it. Why don't y'all give high fives and hugs to everyone around you? High fives and hugs. And then we are going to worship together. Let's go, y'all. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, and you are good.
good. Oh, would you sing this over your life? Sing, you are good. You are good, Jesus, good. Oh, you are good, you're good. Oh.
lifted up.
purpose of this song is to trust in God's promises. So my question for you guys tonight is, what promise do you need to cling to? What promise do you need to sing over yourself and that your heart just needs to hear tonight? And so some of you in this room are maybe just super unclear about life decisions or life choices. And I wanna encourage you in this promise that God will guide your every step. And in Psalms, it says the Lord will fulfill his promises in you. And so if you're struggling with that unclearness, take rest in that, that he's got the whole plan already planned out and you just have to step out in faith. And for some of you, we're just in a season of confusion. Some events have have occurred in your life that have just left you sitting here asking, God, why? God, why did this happen? So I wanna encourage you in this, and I want you to ask God those questions. It's okay to doubt. It pushes us to dig. It pushes us to pray. And God is drawing you near in these circumstances, and James, Chapter one, verse five, it says, for those who lack wisdom, let him ask. And the Lord who gives generously, it will be given to you. That's a promise. Pray for wisdom, pray for understanding and clarity, because God is just beckoning you unto himself. He's putting you in these circumstances so that you can see him more clearly. And there's another promise for those who feel unnoticed or who feel insufficient, or maybe those of you who are just completely burnt out. I mean, we're coming near the end of the semester and spring break is just around the corner and you're just kind of done. Some of you have just mentally checked out in January. And there are some of you who just feel really insignificant. And I wanna encourage you in this. In 2 Corinthians, it says, God is able to make all grace abound in you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times in every good work. God wants to, God wants to give you energy. He wants to give you that push to continue on because he's got good works ahead of you. And it says in scripture that scriptures are weapon. We are fully equipped with every good work that we could ever need to get through. And so I wanna encourage you in that pray and take a hold of this promise that he's gonna give you everything that you need. You're not done yet. He's not done yet with you. And for those who feel discontent and anxious, God says, for my grace is sufficient for you. 
for my power is made perfect in weakness. And therefore in Corinthians, Paul says that therefore, for the sake of Christ, I am content with weakness, insults, persecutions, hardships, and calamities. Notice that Paul says the word content. He's content with all these things. I don't understand how he could be content. This man was beaten. This man was put in jail. He didn't even have a home. He didn't have a place to lay his head. And yet he's content with all of these things. Yet we struggle with contentness, content, uncontentment all the time. And I believe that Paul is content because of God's sufficient grace. Notice that promise, God's sufficient grace grace. Paul was way more worried about his vertical relationship with the Lord than he was with his circumstances. His hope was found in the Lord and in his promises and not in his circumstances. That was where he was concerned with. You guys, some of us are believing a lie today that once you finish school or once you become a real adult or once you do this or that, that some of your anxieties are going to leave you. That is not true. Your anxieties leave in the presence of Jesus only, not in circumstances, in the hope that we have in Christ. And some of you need to hear that today. Some of you need to grab a hold of that promise that his grace is sufficient for you today. Our hope is in Christ. And let me just make this clear too for you guys. When it comes to anxiety and when it comes to our God, our God who raised Lazarus from the dead, our God who was with the three men in the fire and they never got burnt, our God who made the sun stand still, this God can get rid of your anxiety in your heart. I believe in a big God theology. So pray for that overflow. Take this next song and pray that over you and believe and step out in faith that when we focus like Paul in our hope, and this all-sufficient grace, that those things flee from our hearts, amen? Those things flee from us. And so with this next song, let's dive into that. What is that promise you need to cling on?
Would you pray with me? Jesus, we're so thankful. We're so thankful that you are faithful and that every promise that you make will come to pass. That is a promise that you will guide us and you will carry us through this life. In Isaiah, it says that you knew us and you carried us even before we were born. You'll carry us into this life and you will carry us even out of this life. That you have everything under your control. Then you hold us in your hands. You uplift us with your right hand. And that you are for your people. And that you take care of your people. God, we're so thankful for that. We're gonna rest in that promise, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you guys for singing. You can have a seat. Good evening, Overflow. How are you guys doing? I know y'all are like stressed out. You got exams and spring break is coming, right? Yes, yes. like y'all are excited about spring break, I assume. Okay, um, so here's what, what I, I so one is I'm, I'm very thankful to be here. My name is Mike uh, and I have the privilege of serving as the pastor here at Port City Church and working with uh, all the awesome Overflow staff and appreciate them so much. And tonight um, I get to sort of, kick off your spring break. And what I wanna to talk to you about, uh, fittingly enough, is um, what does it look like to make Jesus our Lord? Like we just sang a lot of songs about claiming His promises and all this. And one of the things for me, uh, I'm a little bit older than you guys, but I have been um, obsessed with like process for, for much of my adult life. How do things get to be the way that they are? And so one of the things I wanna to talk to you about tonight or share with you tonight is what I think happens to a lot of us as we get this, this season. I know probably a lot of you are sitting here going, you got exams, you got the pressure of exams. I think some of you guys probably have your last exam on like Thursday, so just in a couple of days. And as soon as that exam, that last exam is over, whether you did really good on it or whether you did really bad on it, you're just gonna breathe and go, because now you're free for like however long you have for spring break. It's just this big exhale, pressure's off, you can escape, you can do what you want. You're gonna call that freedom. And what I found is what a lot of people do is this is how they live their lives. We start this pattern somewhere uh, in high school, maybe before that. And then as we get to be adults, we just sort of get really good at it. We, we, we crunch things. We live under all this pressure. And then as soon as that pressure is relieved, we escape into some illusion of freedom for a little while until the pressure mounts again. It goes from semester to semester to semester to semester. And then when you get to be an adult, it goes from decision or season or decision or season. And you have these little spots in between. And eventually you just get so long between seasons, it just sort of crushes your soul. And I wonder why a lot of people, a lot of people who, well-meaning people, people who long to do God's will, people who long to follow Christ, don't ever experience the freedom that I believe that God has for us. And what I wanna kind of address is the process, the process that starts in every single one of us and it happens all the time. And we're gonna talk about or sing about this and it's in the lines in one of the songs we've been singing is this idea of how we negotiate with God. And I don't know how many of you guys negotiate with God or have negotiated with God or are negotiating with God. Some of you are doing it right now, right? You've got a, a list of things that you think that God is probably telling you to do or telling you not to do. And you're sort of in negotiations with him about why it's okay for you to do this. Well, you don't understand my boyfriend's really sweet or you don't understand this is going on or you don't understand this. And you're talking to God about these things, trying to convince him that what you're doing is actually okay. Or maybe you're trying to convince him that you don't wanna do certain things and this is why he shouldn't ask you to do this or whatever version in between. I've negotiated with God. It's interesting, we usually negotiate with God according to or from the place of fear and what, where you can always tell is you negotiate uh, with God for the things that you hold onto or you want to hold onto. I saw that I made a list because my college experience was uh, quite interesting. I've shared that before. I'm in this group and whenever you get to go talk to high school students or whatever, you usually share this because my experience was a little different than a lot of college students, a lot of high school students. I grew up sort of a good kid. 
And so I didn't do a lot of things, you know, the big things that kind of um, sort of wasn't involved in, you know, I didn't smoke, didn't drink, and all things that, that people kind of did. So you were kind of a good kid, a church kid at that point in time. When I got to college, um, I wanted to do all the things I wasn't allowed to do. I wanted to do all the things I wasn't allowed to do. I, I wanted to go chase girls. I wanted to go drink, you know, and party. I wanted to do all those things. That's what I wanted to do. I was really tired of being the good Christian kid. I wanted to be somebody different. I wanted to try some different things and sort of see if that was the approach. And so what I really did is I started bargaining with God. I started bargaining with God. I started sort of saying, God, you don't understand. I've done all this and all these different things began to unfold. And one night I was having sort of a negotiation session with God in my dorm room, a whining session, if you will. Because what happened was, all of my friends were out partying and doing all the things they wanted to do. And here I was sitting in my dorm room by myself, many Friday nights. Um, my, my girlfriend at the time, her name was Julie. She's my wife now. Um, we had rules. We, we were dated all through college. We dated from high school all through college. And she would come up to the, to the dorm and my roommates would go, hey, I know your girlfriend's coming. We'll all leave. I'm like, no, no, don't leave. Because we had a rule. If, if they left, we would not be in the dorm room by ourselves. And so oftentimes we'd sit on the picnic table in the freezing cold rain, talking to to try and, and do the right thing. And what happened was for me, I felt like all these things, I was trying to do the right thing and things never worked out for me. And I saw all my friends who were doing all the things that they wanted to do, just getting away with it. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. You feel like that before. It's like you're sitting there trying to do the right thing and everybody else is sort of getting away with all the things that you wish you could do. And so I began to negotiate with God and I'm, I'm saying, God, you don't understand. I've been good. This is, I remember reading Psalm 73 one night in my dorm room. Psalm 73 is a beautiful verse. It goes on, it says, it talks about how the wicked get away with everything and that all these people are doing all this stuff. And I'm going, yeah, see God, all these, all my friends, they're like out drinking every night. They're still getting A's. I'm struggling for C's and they're doing this and they're, you know, it's all working out for them. And here I'm, one of my friends is like a total, you know, waste toy and his parents are paying for all this stuff. He drives a nice car, I drive this cruddy car. I'm just whining to God. See God, all the wicked get away with everything. And then this next verse, Psalm 73, five, I believe it says, surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure. Surely God is for no use that I've done all these things. It's no use. And then he just keeps whining and keeps whining and keeps whining and keeps whining and keeps whining till you get to the very end. And it says this, it says, but whom have I in heaven, but you, who else do I desire, but you, but surely the nearness of God is my good. Or actually it says, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. And at some point I had to come to believe and decide that all the things I was missing out on, all the things I was giving up on, all the things I felt like weren't going my way, at some point I had to come and resolve, surely the nearness of God is my good. Surely the fact that God is near to me is enough and sufficient for me. And so I sort of told God on that night, I said, okay, God, here's, here's kind of my deal. Here's my negotiation with you. Instead of going out and doing what most people do, which is they get into college and they go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sow my wild oats and do all this stuff. And then when I regret all that, I'll come back to God at 30 or 35 or 40 or 45, whenever you know, I sort of need you again. Or what I decided to do is says, okay, God, I'm gonna try to do what you asked me to do right here in college. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to obey you. I'm gonna try to listen to you. I'm gonna try to trust that your nearness is my good. I'm gonna try to trust you that this is sufficient for me. And if that hasn't worked, say in 25 years, then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go crazy and sow my wild oats. So I'm about 26 years into that. And it still seems that God has been honoring. He's so faithful, he's so good. I'm so thankful for how he listened to me and didn't just destroy me for all the whining. And what I wanna to talk to you about is how do you negotiate? Because here's the things that I negotiated with God with. When I was in college, in high school, people would say, Mike, do you wanna sell out for Jesus? Do you wanna give your whole life to Christ? I'd say yes. And then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if I, give, if I really do what God wants me to do, he's gonna send me to Africa. And I don't wanna to go to Africa. So it would always be this sort of sense that God was gonna make me go to Africa. I didn't wanna do that. And I've negotiated with God over money. I've negotiated with God over sex. I've negotiated with God over marriage. I've negotiated with God over girls. I've negotiated with God over my position, education. You name it, I've negotiated with God over. And these are all, what I realize is these are all things, and I start negotiating with God, these are the things that I want to hold on to. And fear is what always drives us to negotiate with God. It's the fear that we'll miss out on something that I'll get to send to Africa and all my friends will get to enjoy their whole lives over here in the nice, cushy, comfy United States of America while I'm over there, you know, can't drink the water. Or maybe that I'm afraid that I'll miss out on some career opportunity or some money or some kind of fun or some thing. Maybe I'll miss out. Maybe you'll miss out on partying at spring break like all your other friends are doing. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll miss out on some things and that's what you're negotiating with God over. Or maybe you're afraid that you won't reach your potential. Maybe you're afraid that somehow you're negotiating with God right now because you're afraid that you're not 
doing everything that you're supposed to be doing. And he, he ought to be faster and he ought to be doing more and you ought to be further ahead than you are. And that's only gonna get more and more pressure as you get older. Maybe you're afraid of that. Maybe you're afraid of the disruption. Maybe your life is exactly like you want it. You got the right girl, the right guy. You got the right job lined up. You got all those things. And you're afraid if you do something, if you say, God, I really want you to take my whole life, he's gonna disrupt those plans, that you're gonna lose control. Ultimately, what we are afraid of is we are oftentimes we are afraid to trust. And we end up in our lives driven by fear. You know what the fruit of fear is, right? It's anxiety. Do you know why our culture is plagued by anxiety? It's because we are plagued by fear. And so what I wanna do tonight is I wanna show you kind of how my, my brain works, which will be entertaining at the least, and hopefully it will be helpful to you to process what it is that you might be willing or might be in the middle of a negotiation with and see what might lead you to freedom. I wanna to talk to you and submit to you tonight that what I believe that the path of freedom, when Jesus said, I am the way that uh, if, if you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, what he was talking about, it was not just the information he's gonna give you, will give you, make you better prepared to live your life in your own strength and thereby become free. He was saying to us that I believe that it is under his authority, under his rule, for his glory, is the way that your heart will finally be free. And you're gonna pull and struggle and do all kinds of things until those moments, those glimpses begin to happen. There are three sort of primary components I wanna look at tonight where we end up and why we are driven uh, by fear. Uh, the first one, well, let me, let me do this. Um, we're gonna put up Matthew 6. We've been doing this as a, as a church the last few weeks, looking at this passage of Matthew chapter 16. And this is where Jesus does the famous, upon this rock, I'll build my church. He asked Simon Peter, or he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And, and they say, um, some say you're John the Baptist and Elijah, but, but uh, um, you know, some say you're one of the prophets. And Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And then uh, Simon Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And this is Jesus' response to him. If we put that up on the screen, maybe. There we go. And Jesus replied to Simon's Confession, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. It was not revealed by your own thinking, but it was by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, and in the word that he uses for Peter is the word Petros, and the word he uses for rock in the next sentence is Petra. One is sort of a little rock or a pebble or a stone. The other is a foundation or a bedrock. I tell you, Peter, and on this, that, that, that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. And we talked about that last Sunday, but it's really interesting to me that he talks about this rock. And the way a Jewish person would have understood this, this foundation is not just a foundation that's sort of a place that you rest on, but it's actually the centerpiece. It's the center of who you are. And a rock would have significance for two reasons. Number one is it would be sort of that, that bedrock, that foundation upon which we would live our lives. It also had to do because it was a reminder of when Moses struck the rock in the Old Testament, out of the rock flowed water. And a rock was not only a bedrock foundation, but it was also a source of, of sufficiency and provision. It was a source. So on one parallel, I draw this idea of source, because I'm kind of a graphic person, so I draw this in my, in my journal. On one line, there's, there's sort of source, and I'm gonna put it right here like this, there's source. And he also tells us in this same passage, he says, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And this sort of creates another um, sort of axis here. And this is really what I would consider this way a source, this, this way right here is will. This is whose authority do you live under? Who gets the final say? Who gets the final vote in your life and what you think you're gonna do or not do or what you want? Who gets the final vote in those things? And when I begin to look at this, I begin to see this is sort of this, this is what we think about, uh, think about how we, we can live this out. So if we set up here on the top, we say, okay, this is God and His will and I wanna surrender and do what He wants. And if you don't wanna do what God wants, the odds are you probably wanna do what you want. This is my will. This is how I'm gonna do things. My will be done on earth, uh, right here. My will be done. And so we sort of live this, and this is this, this scale here. And when you think about source, and I wanna think about this a little bit differently tonight because over here, I wanna talk about the thing that actually fuels human beings. The thing that fuels, what fuels human beings is in its essence is really this force called love. 
It's why we use the phrase so flippantly, like when you really get a hankering for something, like I want pizza because I love pizza. You, you use it as your motive. You, you want to do things because there's some kind of deep love or passion for them. So I'm gonna talk about this as, in terms of love. And so if, you're, if, if, if the source is this idea of love over on this side, on the flip side or on the opposite side, the opposite of love, a lot of people say it's hate, but it's really not. It's just indifference. If you don't really, really want pizza and someone says, this is what some of you will do after overflow tonight. So where do you wanna eat? I don't care. And y'all spend three hours trying to figure out where you wanna eat because no one can really decide. And this is what sort of plagues us. This is this idea of source. If we're not motivated by one thing, it sort of pulls us back away from something. And I wanna sort of look at this in this way. Now, here's what's interesting about this. If we sat down and we said, okay, People are really motivated, they're really passionate about, about, about uh, they're, they're, they're moved towards others even, they're just moved. But yet they have this, this real sense of their own self-will. They sort of move out in this direction. And anytime you take the this, this, this source or the essence of God's image and you use it for yourself, you make it something else. So you, you have this really strong passion for other people perhaps, but you have a really strong sense of your own way and your own will. What happens in this quadrant? This is the quadrant that is ruled by manipulation. These are people who are ruled. You're, you're chronically manipulating people. These are people who are afraid of not getting your way. You are so consumed with your will, your plans. What happens that everybody basically becomes a pawn in your game. You have taken something that God gives us as a source and you have used it for your own will and your own way and it becomes something different than what it is. And what happens when you exhaust yourself from getting your way and you can't do it? What if you used every person around you and you can't, when you can't get what you want, you go, well, I didn't really care anyway. And you begin to move backwards in manipulation. And so when you begin to develop a strong sense of indifference and a strong sense of your own self-will, you live over here as a victim. Does anybody know someone who every time you're around them, you feel like they're trying to get you to do something you don't necessarily want to do and you're trying to get you to do it for them? Or you know someone who everything is wrong and they're always, woe is me and this is happening and this and this is because we're in, and this is driven, right? See, this is driven by the fear that you won't get your way. And this is driven by the fear that no one will see or understand your real worth. And what you inevitably do is you use the woe is me to draw people into that, to sort of value you or validate you because it, nothing else seems to work. So both of these are taking, allowing our own self will to rule. So then you move to this side and you say, okay, this idea of ourself, and then maybe say we really do want God's will. If we take God's will and remove the source over here, you get a sense, and I wanna put this word up here, a sense of self-righteousness. And I know nobody knows anybody like this, but these are people who are right in all the wrong ways. These are people who are just afraid to be wrong. So they sort of create this this way and you use God, you use his image. If you try to use God's image apart from his source, you will end up in a very dangerous place hurting a lot of people. This is the fear of sort of not being right. And so we live our lives this, and there's a lot of folks we've taught towards this, a lot of churches have done this. So what is the solution? How do we, how do we not, because this, this, this other quadrant over here, this place over here where it seems to be ruled by God's will and it's sourced by God's love. And this over here is the place that I wanna call freedom. How do we get and live in this quadrant here? Romans chapter 10, now what I do um, I print out the book of Romans. This is the book of Romans on, and I print it on cardstock so I can mark it up with, with Sharpies and such. Uh, it helps me to see things. And so what I usually do is I'll, like, I'll take like chapter um, eight, nine, and 10 and I'll go, okay, here's, here's seven. And I just lay them all out on my desk so I can see it like this. Cause it's a letter, right? And I wanna be able to see it in its, in its, in its fullness. So I, and I'll read it like this and try to understand it and see what's happening in Romans. And it's interesting, you get to chapter 10 and what you see is, is Paul is writing to the Romans. And there's some things that he says in here. He says, Moses writes about this righteousness that is by the law. In other words, there's a way in which you can obey yourself into this idea. There's a way in which you can obey enough to be righteous. And then he adds this warning. 
He says, but the person who, who does these things will live by them. In other words, if you're gonna bank on the law, you're gonna have to live by the law. It's going to be your judge at every turn. But there's a righteousness that is by faith. There's a righteousness that is by faith. And it says this, it says, do not say, and he starts telling this, do not say in your heart, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down or who will descend to the deep that is to bring Christ up. He starts to say, he says that there's a, there's a, a way that says, do not try to figure how this is going to work. You gotta at some point let this go, let our understanding go. This is not revealed to you by flesh and blood. It is revealed to you by God the Father. When we talk about getting before Him and spending time with Him and allow Him to search us and know us, we're talking about things that are revealed by the Father. I've been, I've been kind of drilling this for the last few weeks, but I really believe that every single person in here, some of you are going to spring break and you already have things planned that you know you do not wanna do. You know that you shouldn't, you know that God is not, is not advocating them. And you're already trying to figure out in your head how you're, gonna, how you're gonna justify this, how it's gonna be okay for this week because you've had a long semester because this has happened. And you're trying to rationalize and justify all these things. And we do this because we're negotiating with God. We're negotiating with Him. We're trying to figure out how to get God a little bit more on our terms. We're trying to figure out how to get God okay with what we want to do. And the reason is because we're afraid. We're afraid that we're gonna miss out. We're afraid that we're gonna miss out on something or some opportunity or some experience or some, some, something that's gonna diminish our freedom. And all the while He's promised us, the Son of Man came to set you free. It was for freedom that Christ Jesus set you free. This is Galatians 4, 5, 6, I mean, it's all through there. And so then you come to this next verse in Romans chapter 10, and it says this. So what does it say? If it doesn't say, go try to figure it out, what does it say? And here's what he says. The word is near you. It is in your mouth, it is in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess and are saved. I find it very interesting that this is really the command that Paul writes us. And I think it really parallels with what Jesus taught and what he's teaching us in Matthew 16 and in a lot of his teachings. He did not come to be an advisor to you. He did not even just come to be sort of a comfort to you. He came to be your king. He came and he said, whoever comes underneath and says, thy will be done in my life, that's the ones who begin to experience this. It's by his will and by his source. It's not his will and your strength. Whenever you start to move away from his source, you're gonna find yourself in one of these two places. And he's, he's saying to us, if, how do we, he, it's, it's in your heart, it's near you. He goes on, he says this. It says that in your heart you believe and are justified and with your mouth you shall be saved. In your heart you believe and with your mouth you confess. And these, you know, this is believing, this, this, this justifies you, this makes you right. And he says, this right here saves us. Saves us from what? If you grew up in the church, a lot of you just didn't say like it saves us from hell. What if it wasn't just saving you from hell? What if it saved you from every one of these other things and actually saved you in order to set you free? How different is that message? When he comes to you and he says, when you confess me as Lord of all those areas of your life, when you confess me as Lord, right, he will set you free. The rock is foundation and source and provision. The keys are will and authority. And he says that whoever comes and says, you are my Lord, you will be set free. This is what Paul, Jesus talked about in Matthew 15. He says, out of our mouth, flows the desires of our heart. The reason he tells us to confess with our mouth is not just sort of a rote, your Lord, your Lord, your Lord. It's a call for us to believe in our heart. It's a call for you to listen to that voice, 
to listen to what God is saying to you in the very still places of your heart that you know are there. To listen to that and to trust that and then to declare this because it's in that declaration, it's in sort of ascribing to this, affirming this, that we actually begin to live it out and are set free. And here's what I think is so powerful. This this is where I want to land and we're going to sing uh, this this idea together tonight because I want you to get a picture in your mind. A lot of us, we think that sort of this idea when we say, God, your will, not mine. We begin to sort of feel like our will is bad and his will is good. And I don't want you to think about it that way. The things that you want to do, the desires that you have are actually good. They're they're rooted in something good. They're rooted in this desire for life. They are there. That's that's why they're there. That's why you want to graduate. That's why you want to do well. I say, there's something something deeply valuable. And what I want you to understand is that when you sit down and you say, you're negotiating with God because you think that maybe your will is better than his. That's what I thought. God, if you love me, make me an architect. Make me a rich architect so I can live on the beach. I'll give a lot of money to the church. The church could use money. What a great strategy for kingdom advancement. He wasn't interested in my money. He was interested in my heart. He wasn't interested in what I would do or not do for him. He was interested in who I was becoming, who he had made me to be. What I had to come to understand is that my will wasn't better than his. It wasn't I was giving up something. What I had to realize is that his will is actually worthy of mine. When I proclaim him as Lord, what I'm saying is not only are you my king and my ruler, what I'm saying is that your will is actually worthy of mine. It's actually something that I can celebrate and say your will is, it's a, it's a joy, it's a thrill that I bring my will into subjection to yours because your will is worthy of mine. You know what happens or what it's called when you do something because you believe that something is worthy of you doing that? You know what it's called? It's called worship. When Romans 12, just a couple of chapters later, and you've all heard this passage probably, Paul writes, he says, I urge you brothers by the mercies of God to offer your bodies as living sacrifices for this is your spiritual act of worship. This is your spiritual act of worship for you and your lives to be an act of worship. It's not just because you sing the right songs or do the right things or have the right morals. It's because you live out of the conviction, listening to that whisper in your heart, you are Lord and your will is worthy of mine. Our declaration of lordship, to proclaim his Lord is not a ticket into heaven. Jesus, your Lord, good, now I'm going. That's not what this passage is talking about. Your confession of his lordship is actually your declaration of his worth. And I want for you tonight as we wrestle with this and maybe as, you, as we sing this song, I want for you to stop and think, what are you negotiating with God over? What are the places where you're negotiating with God? What are the places, where, what are you holding on to that sort of keeps you manipulating people or keeps you, you know, being the one who uh, nothing ever works out for me or being the one who no one wants to be around because you're always right. And we could add more to these boxes, but I think you get the idea. What is it you're holding on to? What is it that you are afraid that he's going to mess with or disrupt or tinker with if you said to him, okay, Jesus, be Lord of this. Be Lord of my thoughts in this area. Be Lord of my body here. Be Lord of this relationship here. Be Lord of the way I treat this person or the way I enter into this or be Lord in this place where I feel so much fear and anxiety or be Lord of spring break or be Lord of whatever it is. What is it you are holding on to? What is it you are negotiating with God over? He says, the word is near you. It is in your heart. It is in your mouth. Are you willing to listen to that? To trust that? Because what I'm telling you is that confession, the reality is that his will isn't just something he wants you to comply with to torture you or to test you. His will is something that he wants you to come to understand is actually worthy of your life because that's what he's made you for. And when you say to him, Jesus is Lord, what you're saying is in essence, you know me. I'm no longer gonna negotiate with you. I'm gonna bring this to you and allow you to do your work in me. And what I'm telling you you're gonna find is a freedom that no circumstance and no fear can undermine or take away. And I believe that all of us want to live like that. Tonight as we sing the words of this song, we're gonna say, God, I cast all my doubts and fears before you, all of them. I feel that I might have the right job, 
my fear I may never get married, my fear I may never have the right boyfriend or girlfriend, my fear of this, my fear, of, I'm gonna place all these, all these doubts that you have, I'm gonna place them all before you. I'm not gonna negotiate with you anymore. You are Lord. And when you declare him as Lord, you are declaring him as worthy of your will and therein your obedience becomes worship. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the students that are gathered here as they prepare themselves to head, um, to get through finals, as they prepare for a little break from school. God, I ask that you would, Father, tonight meet us. Um, we have places in our lives that we hold on to desperately because we're afraid. We're afraid maybe you'll send us to Africa. We're afraid maybe you'll cause a relationship uh, to have to end. We're afraid because we'll have to stop this behavior or that behavior. We're, we have all kinds of reasons we're afraid. But Father, my prayer is that we would come to see you as our Lord, not as someone who wants to take from us, but as someone who has given to us. And that, Father, we will begin to experience your freedom as we stop negotiating and we start confessing that you are simply more than what we have thought. So, Father, use this moment to help us be attentive to the word that is near us, it is in our hearts. And God, may we listen to that voice in these next few moments. And I'll lift this name of your son, Jesus.
Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's hands. I will rest in the Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's In the Father's hands, leave the rest in the Father's hands. Oh, I will rest in the Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's hands. So I throw. Yes, our prayer as you leave this place is that you would cast everything at the feet of Jesus because he's big enough to handle it. That you would remember what you heard tonight, what Mike brought. And that you would accept the challenge to stop negotiating with your father and to trust that he knows best and that you can rest in his promises. We're so grateful that you guys are here with us tonight. Remember, next week is spring break, so there's no overflow and there'll be people down front if you'd like to pray or talk about anything. We love y'all. We'll see y'all in two weeks.